uh, Jay and I have been scheming for several emails and lots of conversation over cocktails and just as two guys dressed sort of uh, Brooks brothers uh, over how to begin today. And we've come up with, I think, a shared solution, and we hope you well, like I want, it. Well, I want to ask him a question. I'm doing this totally impromptu. I'm throwing him off his stride. You, you already, now you've wrecked it. <laughs> <laughs> He's wrecked it. Who, how many of you came to hear me yesterday? Uh, okay, who I came to hear me about April 1865? Okay. Uh, oh. So we probably have half of these people have not yeah. heard you yet. Okay. So you still have an opportunity to make a first impression. <laughs> I thought it was you do. I thought it was dazzling already. You know, it, it's so funny to well, self-absorbed as always to have the job that I have because I just want to get out of the way. But Jay makes it so much fun that uh, you know we've gotten to know each other a little bit. I don't think it'll last. So <laughs> what we're going to do here is I'm going to read a list of names. And all of these names are names that Jay Winnick has studied extensively and is very, very conversant about their lives, their persona, uh, and their place in history. And we're just going to wing it from there. So I'm going to Well, I, I thought you were going to say has brilliantly written about. That's how he did it in his email. He actually said that about himself. Anyway, so these are the some of the bios you have uh, become very familiar with. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, Joseph Stalin, Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Ben Franklin, King Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette, Robespierre, Prince Potemkin. Uh, I think that's a good start. So... Having thrown out that roster, Jay, would you just give us a thought on one or two and why, what it was like to research them and what you came away with and what you'd like to impart to these very smart people? Yeah, that's a, it's a wonderful question. And in effect, what we have in that list is sort of a gallery of some of the most significant historical figures in the last uh, two, three hundred, four hundred years. And, you know, what, if you think of the Americans I've written about, as, as you said, FDR, obviously, for World War II. I've written about Abraham Lincoln. Um, I wrote, I've written about George Washington. I think I'm the only major public historian who's written about all three of those figures. Um, I've written about Hamilton. I've written about Jefferson, about Madison, about Franklin. And, you know, one thing that I've often been asked is, who would I most want to have at a dinner party? And I think that's a great question. And on one hand, I always come back and I think about Abraham Lincoln. I want you all to think about Abraham Lincoln for a second. Uh, you know, we know him as our greatest president, but who is he? How did he get to be what he was and who he was? Well, in Lincoln's case, he was a one-term congressman, a failed senatorial candidate twice. He had virtually no education. He was self-educated. Um, he had moods and depressions that were so deep, so profound, that he once said, I can't carry a penknife because he was afraid he would slit his own wrists. And he was a backwoods lawyer. And who, who was he? How was this man going to be the one who would guide us through the greatest tribulation the nation had ever faced in the Civil War? Think of how, how it was when he first got elected. He was back in Springfield. He got word that he had been elected. Of course, he hadn't been on the ballot anywhere in the South. Ten states in the South, nowhere did his name actually appear in the ballot. And now all of a sudden, he was president of the United States, and he's being told that the South is thinking about seceding. And so he had this terrible dilemma he had to face. Does he go to war to keep the United States together? Does he do everything he can to eradicate slavery? Does he accept slavery? So there were all these profound dilemmas and questions that he had to wrestle with. Um, oh, there's somebody trying to get in here. So, Excuse me. An interloper. She's not getting into this group. Usually, usually when I speak, I don't double as a doorman. But <laughs> <laughs> so so p please, please tell the organizers of the Rancho Mirage Festival that he really put in his work today. <laughs> okay, get, getting back to Abraham Lincoln. Um, so in Lincoln's case, when he finally comes to Washington, he had to go on a train that nobody knew he was on because they were afraid of him being assassinated. And literally within the first day of his being president, landing on his desk was word that Fort Sumter was about to be besieged. 
So this man with no military experience, this man with no executive experience, this one-term failed congressman is now facing the dilemma of does he go to war over Sumter? And he pulls his cabinet, and almost to a man, all of his cabinet, they don't want to go to war. You know, we all think of the Civil War as being inevitable. Well, his own cabinet didn't want to go to war. In fact, his own Secretary of State had been deep in negotiations with the South to tell them that, in effect, don't worry about what will happen with Fort Sumter. They will make this whole issue go away. Uh, so in other words, his own cabinet was undercutting him. So one night, Lincoln wasn't sure what to do, so he went up to his, his study upstairs in the White House, and he turned on, he didn't turn on a light, he lit a candle, and, um, and he worked for hours into the wee hours of the morning. And eventually he decided he was going to go to war. And he decided he wouldn't fire the first shot, but that he would, he would, he would basically barricade Fort Sumter and force the, so the South to fire the first shot. So when the first shot was fired, they quickly took Fort Sumter, the Southerners. And, um, and what, what did Lincoln think? I mean, well, he thought this would be a war that would last for a couple of months. He thought it would be a mere skirmish. He didn't realize that within four years, it would consume some 620,000 lives. Now, in today's parlance, that would mean six, six million dead. And that's just an awful, terrible cost. And even as late as 1864, during the Battle of the Wilderness, this was a year after the great Gettysburg victory, um, the two top generals finally squared off against each other. His general, U.S. Grant, squared off against Robert E. Lee. Well, in Cold Harbor, in the first 10 minutes alone, the United States would lose some 10,000 men. That's three times as many as Pickett would lose at Pickett's charge. <laughs> Over the course of six weeks, the United States would lose some 55,000 men. That's as many as we would lose in the entirety of the Vietnam War. Now at this point, Lincoln was so exhausted, he was so worn, he was so weary, he was so tired, that he was just pacing the walls of the, pacing the halls of the White House. He was clasping his hands behind his back, and he was hanging his head, and he just was muttering over and over, saying, I must have some relief from this anxiety or it will kill me. Well, it almost did kill him, but nonetheless, he persisted. If he were any other man, I believe he would not have stuck with the war and we would be two countries today. So when I look at this rogues gallery of these people, I think, well, Abraham Lincoln is somebody who really catches my heart. But if we get back to the dinner partner question, who would I want to have? Would you want to have George Washington with you? Or Hamilton? Or Jefferson? Or Madison? Who wouldn't want to be sitting next to them? Well, anyway, in my case, I'm not sure I'd want to have dinner with them. I'd want to have dinner with somebody else. And that would probably be Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great, the Empress of all the Russians. She was an extraordinary woman. She came in as an autocrat. Um, she murdered her husband to get to where she was as the Tsarina. Um, We've seen some of that around here. I mean, she, she, she had many lovers, but it did not pay to be her husband. And, but, but Catherine was just an extraordinary woman. She corresponded both with Washington as well as with Jefferson. And, and she wanted to have different words for the word peace. She actually went on a listen, listening tour in Russia in which she went all around the different Russias. And remember, just remember how big Russia is. It just, as, as the sun is rising in one part of Russia, it's setting in another part. That's how big it is. But she went all around Russia on a listening tour. And in effect, she was taking the democratic pulse of all her different peoples. She was a warrior. She tried to subjugate the Ottoman Empire, or she put them those heathen Muslims. Um, she, was, she was just a great intellect as well. She p supported the French and the French philosophers, the French philosophers. And, um, and there seemed to be nothing about her. And she was a great romantic as well. At one point, she posted a sentry outside of her winter palace. And this sentry's job was to do only one thing, one thing all year, and that was to protect the first snowflake. And I mean, you have to love that. So I think if I could have dinner with anyone, I'd want to have dinner with Catherine the Great. Now, there's one other thing I want to talk about. And who is the most tragic of these figures? Um, it's a little bit. Oh, you can't hear me back there? OK. Um, excuse me. Kind Who was the most tragic of these figures you, we were, you were hit? Yeah. On? You know, I've, in the course of my research, I, have actually, I actually became very fond of Marie Antoinette. 
Of course, we all know Marie Antoinette is her impolitic comment where she said, let them eat cake. Um, but she was this, this extraordinarily uh, sort of interesting woman who was kind of flighty and, and, um, and not very substantive for much of the French Revolution. But there was this very memorable scene when eventually the French Revolution was sort of spinning out of control and they took her husband, Louis the Sixteenth. They took him prisoner and he was going to be beheaded on the, on the next day. And at, at this point, Marie Antoinette was in the tower with her children and Louis the Sixteenth was kind of brought up to see her and this was going to be their last time ever seeing each other. And, um, and, and Louis the Sixteenth didn't want her to feel that way. He didn't want her to think that. And so the children were weeping when Louis the came up. And remember, Louis, this was the king of France who was now a prisoner and was going to be beheaded. Um, but he, he came up to see them in the tower and the children were just weeping hysterically. And then Louis the Sixteenth said, my dear, don't worry about me. Everything will be okay. And he said, and now I must go to be with my priest and I want to pray. And she said, oh, but Louis, please come back. And he said, he said, I promise, I'll be back in the morning. So they woke up early in the morning. The, the children were up. Marie Antoinette was up. Dawn came in. The sun rose. And then all of a sudden they heard all these loud shouts and these screams and these hurrahs. And then what she didn't realize is at that point the, the guillotine had come down and her, her husband's head was being held up. And so I think that that's a very, very tragic, um, it, it's very, very poignant. And then in her case, she was brought down to a prison herself, and she had only one little aide, one little woman who was tending to her every need. And, um, and think about this. At one point, this was the Queen of France. This was one of the great empires that the world had ever seen. This is where they had culture. This is where they had arts. This is where they had great painters. I mean, everything glittered about the French, uh, the French royalty. And now she was in this little dungeon with one little woman, and she was wearing a white dress, and um, and she was eventually taken to to be beheaded, and she did so with great dignity. So I, I find that very fascinating. How can a revolution that was based on the notion of freedom, of liberation, turn so horrifically, violently anti-civilization, anti-humanity? Uh, how how can when is that switch thrown? Uh, well, in this case, French Revolution, and is there any way to see that coming? Mm. Well, I interestingly enough, in the case of the French Revolution, they were trying to emulate, in the beginning, the American Revolution. And of course, in the American Revolution, we had nothing like that. It was, it was very civil. We didn't have beheadings. We didn't have executions. Well, you had it some tar and feathering. So <coughs> you had quite a bit of violence, no, actually. You, 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 yes, but not to the extent of being... No, 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 nothing like the French. But, I mean, it, was, it got tough, too. Yeah. Nothing like the French. Um, well, re revolutions, one never knows where they're, going to, where they're going to head and where they're going to end up. And in the case of the French Revolution, in the beginning, they had these sort of stirring words that emulated the Americans and even went further in terms of the rights of man, as they called it. Um, but it just, it just, it spun out of control, and it's, it's, um, it's the unpredictability. It's the same thing that what that happened in the Russian Revolution, as well. Well, is that a mob that has gotten out of control, or the, there has to be a germ for that? Again, that switch, that trigger. Uh, it, ju it seems to me there's a moment where you can say, "Oh boy, they got beyond frisky. Now they, they, they really mean business, and they're absolutists of their own cause." And uh, there's no sense of right and wrong anymore. The end justifies the means. Right. Well, this, this is the beauty and the genius and the importance of democracy. Because what democracy is about at its essence, and what was the genius of what the founders did in contrast to the rest of the world, is that they devised a system in which we could have political differences, in which we can argue forcefully, in which we can argue heatedly, in which we can even despise the other side, but we always do so peaceably. We don't resolve things by violence, we resolve things by words. That's the genius <coughs> of what the founders did, and it's, it's something that did not happen in the French Revolution, and it didn't happen in the Russian Revolution, it didn't happen in the Iranian Revolution. So there we see that this handful of men, these radicals, these Americans, they kind of defied the rest of the world, and they created something that nobody else has really been able quite to emulate. We uh, agreed sort of to move through the ether pretty quickly and topics, people, et cetera. 
you were uh, one of the first, if not on the first plane, of Americans uh, headed to Cambodia mm. uh, after that horror, Pol Pot and uh, that revolution. Could you, uh, do you want to give us that? You're so good at expressing what it looks like, what it feels like, who's involved, and the energy of that. Well, I mean, this, this is really in a previous life before I became a writer and historian. Um, but I had the, I don't want to say the fortune, but the fascinating experience of being on the first plane to go back to Cambodia after, after the killing fields. And, and it was a small little plane. It was actually a CIA plane. Um, and uh, we had a military escort. I was with a couple of senators. And we weren't sure, actually, how we would even get there because there was no way to get in touch with the Cambodians directly. We did it through the Vietnamese. And there was a concern that we might even be shot down at one point. And, um, and then when we landed in Phnom Penh, I still remember we walked, we walked off the plane, we walked down the stairs, and a Cambodian met us. And the very first thing he did when he met us is he took a sheet of, a sheet of paper out of his pocket and he handed it to, who I was with Senator Chuck Robb, and he handed it to Rob, and Rob immediately handed it to me because he thought if somebody was going to go to prison that day, better me than him. <laughs> 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 and so, so I very warily put it in my coat pocket, and I thought, oh, my God, Did what have I... Did you bring that with you today by any chance? No, I didn't. I, I didn't know we'd be talking about this. Um, but that, that morning we met with, um, with Hang Sum Rin, who was the communist leader of Cambodia, and he had been part of the Khmer Rouge, of course, the deadly killing fields, uh, tool slang, the, the skulls piling up. And, um, and nobody had ever spoken to him before, and we had no idea what to expect. And there were these crude tapes kind of running. Um, they, it was as if they were 100 years previous in time. And, um, and it was a very kind of worrisome day, uh, but we talked about how it's important to get rid of political violence, how America is watching. Um, it was very tragic, though. I mean, that was a people who have really... Uh, the people of Cambodia suffered dearly, and, um, and you know, they're still suffering to this day. Well, they still suffer from uh, mines. I was in a rotary club in Connecticut, and our biggest thrust every year was to demine portions of Cambodia. And at lunch, we would mount the, the map, mm. and we would uh, put, <coughs> you know, hash marks where we had cleaned up an area. I mean, I thought it was one of the greatest... Tra uh, charitable efforts ever. It's certainly not a pat on the back to us, but it was just common sense that if a farmer was trying to do something in a peasant culture, let's not have him lose his legs right. in the process. Right. Now, but the thing about Cambodia that's so interesting is, is, at least from my perspective, that shows you what happens when there's a civil war that spins out of control. And that's what's so unique about the American Civil War. As I said yesterday, for those of you who heard me, most civil wars end badly with more violence more bloodshed, more turmoil, and more chaos. If you look at Syria today, if you look at Iraq, if you look at what happened in Vietnam, well, in America, we could have had, at the end of our, our civil war, basically what we would call the, in effect, the Syrianization of America or the Vietnami Vietnamization of America. And just imagine that if we had had guerrilla warfare and the two sides would have cleaved each other, we'd be two countries today and maybe even two hostile countries today. But why didn't that happen? The reason why it didn't happen, which was so important and unique to our story, is that we had a handful of men who, perhaps unlike today, rose above and beyond the passions and the partisan hatreds of the day, and they rose above the hatreds in general of the day. So you had Abraham Lincoln, who after having fought this tough, tough, tough war against the South, this total war against the South, this war where he unleashed Bill Sherman, who cut a swath of burning some 450 miles of the South and taking one city after another, after another, even to the point of where for Christmas he burned down Savannah and then he sent a jaunty note to Abraham Lincoln and he said, Mr. President, I beg to present you a Christmas gift, the city of Savannah. Wow. But, but after having done all that, then it came to be the time where eventually Robert E. Lee was surrounded and of course Lee wanted more than anything else to win the war. And, um, and it, but instead Lee had to go at this point, as he put it, I shall now have to be General Grant's prisoner. And he went to a little place called Appomattox to surrender. And just think about this surrender for a second. Lee walks into what was called the Wil Wilbur McLean House. 
And he's wearing his finest uniform that day because, as he put it, he said, I must surely be Grant's, as I said, prisoner on this day. And he was uncharacteristically quite nervous. And the reason why he was nervous is because he knew that defeated rebels throughout history had been beheaded. They had been hung. They had been imprisoned. Or like Napoleon, they had been exiled. And so he was worried about what would happen. And he should have been worried because he didn't realize that on that day as he was going to surrender, Andrew Johnson, the vice president, was in Washington, D.C., giving a rousing speech to a crowd of several thousand. And he said, hang Lee, hang Jefferson Davis, hang them 20 times. So he was actually quite nervous and quite worried. So he walked in, and then U.S. Grant came in wearing a much spattered private spouse. And, um, and in, in the beginning, they didn't talk about the war. They didn't talk about the surrender. Actually, they reminisced about the old days. And Grant was actually in awe of Robert E. Lee because this was the great commander. And he said, I remember you from the days of the Mexican War. So they chatted amiably back and forth. And then eventually, um, it was Lee who said, General Grant, I suppose we, just sh we should discuss why we're here, the question of surrender. And Grant did several important things. And in doing so, he was carrying out the wishes of, of Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln had said earlier to Grant at City Point, he said, when this, all, when this is all over, there must be no bloody work, there must be no hangings, there must be none of that. In other words, he was saying there must be nothing like the French Revolution. And, um, and he said, instead, there should be a tender peace. There should be a soft peace. Uh, we have to reintegrate each other. We have to learn to live together once more. Um, so Grant did three really fascinating things. He allowed the rebels to keep their sidearms as well as to keep their horses. Now, in both cases, this made no sense if you're worried about there being a, a guerrilla war to kind of perpetuate the Civil War. Uh, but what Grant was saying loudly and clearly is we may have defeated you, but we honor you. We may have defeated you, but we are to become brothers once more. And then after that was done, Robert E. Lee went around in this Wilbur McLean house, and he shook hands with everyone there. He shook hands with, with Grant, then he shook hands with all the aides. And then the last person there was an Indian, a Seneca Indian. And Lee looked over at him, and he said, I'm glad to see we have one real American here. And, and the Indian looked back at, uh, the Seneca looked back at Lee, and he said, General, we are all Americans here. Think of how stirring that was. And then Lee walked out, and um, as he walked out onto this, the porch of the Wilbur McLean house, um, there turned out there were men, men in the tens of thousands, who were there waiting to watch this piece of history take place, the surrender of Lee to U.S. Grant and Abraham Lincoln. So Lee walked down. He walked down one step, down, a, down another step, down another. And then he got on his horse, Traveler. And then all of a sudden, he let out a loud sigh, just like that. And he just looked careworn and tired. And everybody tensed when they saw him do that, wondering, what does this mean? What's going to happen? And what happened next would be the boldest stroke of the entirety of the war and in part, maybe, of any war. U.S. Grant came out, and in front of all his officers and all his men, he tipped his hat to salute Lee, and he was saying, we are to become brothers once more. And with that, that sent a tone throughout the, throughout the country, and somehow, despite all the, ha the hatreds and passions, we were able to come together. Wouldn't it be great if we had that kind of leadership today? So if uh, Bernie Sanders were to win, let's say in 2020, that's the kind of transition we can expect. I don't do contemporary politics. <laughs> I don't think we do anymore either. Um, while you're uh, on that, and I know some of you were, were with Jay yesterday, probably uh, even deeper into this. The, that story is just so rich, and uh, I don't think it's well known, I, truthfully. I think an awful lot of people have said, oh, the Civil War, that's for the people that put on the uniforms and reenact it. Yeah. But it's so important, and the way you tell it is just so great. Um, and and in, in a shameless plug, I'll just say it was the number one bestseller. So if you so that was unnecessary. I mean, that's a, we have the book here if you want to buy it. I didn't know we were plugging that, but we do have Jay's books here. But you see, we, we double as a comedy act. Yeah, no, it's not that great either. Can you uh, tell us, well, please? Speak, speak for yourself. Yes, if if you would uh, tell us, please, um, about the again facts that I don't think are widely known about the Lincoln assassination and. What else? The other assassinations that might have. Right, right. Well, remarkable. Well, well, picture this if you can for a second. That 
when Robert E. Lee surrendered to, to U.S. Grant, he surrendered only his army. There were still three Confederate armies in the field, their gun barrels hot to the bitter end. There were still 175,000 men waiting to be told by Jefferson Davis, what do we do next? There was Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, his, on the run, calling for guerrilla warfare. And even Mary Lee, Mary Lee, Robert E. Lee's wife, Mary Lee, who was descended directly from Martha Washington, Mary Lee, who said about her own husband, Robert E. Lee, he is not the Confederacy. And she even said Richmond is not the Confederacy. So in other words, things were still quite incendiary. And the question at the time was, how much longer could this last? Could it be six months, a year, a year and a half? Well, such time spans had been enough to complicate uh, the peace to come and unseat great dynasties. And just five days after, five days after Lee surrenders, imagine what happens. Three deadly assassins fanned out at 10.15 at night. The first one made his way into Ford's Theater, where Abraham Lincoln, the hero of Appomattox, just wanted to get a little bit of entertainment. And I see we have Derek Jacoby right here, uh, speaking of entertainment, so I want to <laughs> hear you. Um, but a anyway, so, so John Wilkes Booth goes in, he finds, he finds Abraham Lincoln, and he shoots him in the head. And at 722 in the next morning, the great American president, our greatest American president, was dead. Same time at night, 1015, another deadly assassin made his way into William Seward's house, the Secretary of State. He stabs him not once, not twice, not three times, but five times. And only by a mere fluke is Seward even alive, but his, his life is hanging by a thread. And then the third assassin was about to shoot Andrew Johnson, but only at the last second did he get cold feet. But imagine the chaos uh, that was taking place at the time. This was their 9-11 of the day, just five days after Appomattox. And it, in fact, at one point, the Chief Justice of the United States said, oh my God, we are living through a night of horrors. And in fact, in this night of horrors, what did they think was happening? Well, they thought there was a Napoleonic coup underway. And who did they think was behind the Napoleonic coup? Not Jefferson Davis, not Robert E. Lee. They thought it was their own great general, Bill Sherman. And they were even thinking about even arresting him at one point. And, um, and how we all came together is just remarkable. Now, in uh, tribute to Jay, this is an interesting leap. It's your book, from which this is, is beautifully presented, April 1865, was the book carried by whom at what point? Okay. Um, we all remember the horror of 9-11. Um, on the next day after 9-11, I actually went out and I was playing tennis that, that morning to just, it was so terrible what had happened and I just had to get away and kind of clear my head. And then when I got home, I realized there were something like 200 messages on my answering machine. And the reason why that was is because George Bush had just come back from Camp, da had come back from Camp David and, um, and as he stepped off of Marine One onto the lawn of the, the South Lawn of the White House, he was carrying my book April 1865. And that photograph went round the world. And then shortly after that, Bush had me into the White House. We had a private lunch. We had a dinner. He had me there some 12 times to talk about the war on terror. And really not, not that I was a strategist in the war on terror, but he wanted to have a sense of lessons from history to see how it could illuminate or shed light or give him guidance for what was, for what was taking place then. And, um, and one of the things that really impressed me with Bush um, who is much kind of a more complicated figure than he's often been portrayed in the press, is, um, is we talked a lot about Lincoln. He wanted to know what Lincoln went through. He wanted to know how Lincoln suffered. He wanted to know how it felt when men were sent to their death. And um, so anyway, so President Bush and I developed a strong and intimate friendship, and, um, and I never get involved in partisan activities. I don't care about politics personally. But having said that, I mean, he was the president. It was a time of great need for the nation. Um, he thought I could be of help, so I was happy to go in there and speak. And then another thing that I did around the same time is Vice President Cheney, Cheney called me up and he said, would you come into the Vice President's mansion? And, um, and it was a small little dinner. We had candlelight there. I mean, it actually sort of felt like it must have felt to, to Lincoln and the other members of his cabinet what it was like at the dawn of the Civil War. And, um, and we had a kind of robust discussion in which I gave up, I got up and gave a, a little presentation about, again, what history said about presidents and how they deal with war. 
And um, and as we were going around the table, and Carl Rove was there. If you speak to Carl, he'll tell you about it. Um, but as we went around the table, at one point, Lynn Cheney, Vice President Cheney's wife, she looked over to me and she said, so how was it when Lincoln sent men into battle? Wasn't that hard? And I talked about how hard it was. And in fact, on that night, I don't know how I came up with this, I paused it. I said, you know, we could end up in a war in Iraq. And, uh, and I said, if we do, it could go on for a long time. It could be bitter. It could be a terrible, terrible struggle. And in fact, that, that's uh, what ended up happening. And uh, I guess we collectively kind of wish that didn't happen, but um, <coughs> at any rate. Well, look, in, in life, as, as um, you know, you solve one dilemma, and then another dilemma crops up. Well, it was a traditional response to something. A horrendous attack on the United States should mm -hmm. bring about something where we thought there were weapons of mass destruction, et cetera. I mean, it's pretty clearly right. the choreography of our getting into that war is pretty clear. You know, one thing I'll say that was very interesting is I remember talking with Dick Cheney that night, and, um, and what was on his mind was not just what had happened on 9-11 itself, but their concern and their fear was not simply what had happened with the airplanes, um, but they, they were saying is, is we, we were lucky in the sense that it could have been much worse. We just weren't prepared for other things that could have happened. And so what was weighing heavily on their minds was when will the other shoe drop? And thank God the other shoe didn't drop. Well, you couldn't help but think, and we were very much New York Metro at that point. In fact, my son, <coughs> thank God, uh, did not die in 9-11. He was due to be at Cantor Fitzgerald that morning. But he had uh, changed uh, had a change of heart on his career, so thank God he escaped that. Uh, but as I thought of those uh, planes coming down the Hudson, that one plane coming down the Hudson, it could have hit the Indian Point nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. yep. It could have taken out the George Washington Bridge or certainly uh, made it pretty useless for quite a few months. But instead, I guess the symbolism of, uh, well, what, private enterprise and, and prosperity and tall and reaching for the sky with uh, Western values and Western civilization became the, the uh, symbol that they were looking for. Right, right, exactly. Well, on that cheer, and, 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 and uh, one, other, one other thing I'll say about that is, um, is one of the other things that we talked about is was a question of civil liberties, of course, because we were worried about there being an overreaction towards Muslims and that some civil liberties were potentially being taken away. And, um, and as I said, I, I like to stay away from political issues. I'm not political myself. And, um, and I, I want to be trusted. And, you know, my readers and my fans are of both parties. They're presidents of both parties. They're senators of both parties. They're just American people of both parties. Um, but nonetheless, the Wall Street Journal asked me to write about civil liberties in wartime in history. And so they actually gave me an entire page to talk about it. And, um, and what I found was kind of quite interesting is that going back to the very beginning, John Adams during the Quasi War was very tough on civil liberties. He, he promulgated something called the Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, then, of course, in Abraham Lincoln's case, well, Lincoln, it turns out, was very tough on civil liberties. At one point, the, the legislature in Baltimore was considering a vote in which they might have talked about their seceding. So what did Lincoln do? He just arrested them and threw them in jail. And then there was a congressman named Clement Vlandekam who was just giving fits to Lincoln. And so what did Lincoln do? He put him in jail as well. Well, there are great howls and protests. And so Lincoln, he said, okay, I'm going to release him from jail. And he did something else. He just ejected him into the South. Uh, so Lincoln was actually quite tough and quite harsh on civil liberties, as was Woodrow Wilson. So what I decided was is that as unsettling and as difficult and unseemly as these uh, abrasions of civil, liberty, uh, civil liberties was happening, um, the tradition of civil liberties has always been very strong in American history and in our American psyche. And I thought not only will they return, but they'll return even stronger before. And... Um, and I think that's what happened. And, and so in a sense, this all takes us back in some ways to the founders. It takes us back to Washington, to Hamilton, to Jefferson, to Madison, to Franklin. And who were these men? These men, they weren't moderates. They were radicals. Most of America, they didn't want to separate from the mother country in Britain. They wanted to stay a part of it or, or they were neutral. But this was, as somebody said at the time, this was a small group of men who were hustling the multitude. So they were, I mean, they were radical. To think that they had the audacity to take on the greatest empire in the world. 
And, um, and yet when they signed the Declaration of Independence, um, at that point, very memorably, Benjamin Franklin said, well, we will surely all hang together or we will hang separately. And, um, and that's what they took. <coughs> and to think that they, they devised this edifice, this thing called America, this Constitution. And think about the Constitution for a second. When these men assembled, uh, when these men assembled in Philadelphia, they weren't supposed to be doing a Constitution. They were supposed to be doing nothing like that. It was totally extra legal. Put differently, it was probably illegal. Yet for four months, they were, they were battling the heat. They were swatting away flies. They were locking up the windows. They didn't want the press to come in. Um, and eventually, they came up with this remarkable document that endures to this day, this document that guides us as Americans, whether we're Republicans, whether we're Democrats, whether we're independents. Um, it guides us to this day, and that's the Constitution. And at that point, them having taken this leap into the dark, um, Benjamin Franklin, who was an old and tired man at this point, and he was racked by great pain, and he was taking laudanum, basically like a morphine substance, and, um, and he could barely walk, so he had to be carried in. And, uh, you know, and, and Franklin was a really kind of f audacious, funny, fast, fascinating man. You know, when he was in France, he said, my face is as famous as the moon. And he had women just swooning all over him all the time. But here he was in Philadelphia, and he was tired, and he was oh, in pain. And, um, and they had finished their work, and they had created this constitution, and they were ready to kind of bring it to the world. And, um, and it was at that point where Franklin looks over to the president's chair, and he says, you know, I have long thought about this chair and what it shows. I don't know if it shows a rising sun or a setting sun. And then he paused for a moment, and he looked over to the rest of the delegates. He looked over to Washington, and he looked over to Madison, and he looked over to Hamilton, and he said, I believe this is a rising sun. That's America. And how ironic it is <clears throat> that I believe freedom of speech is absolutely at the, sort of the way an atom is structured, at the very core of the atom of this country is freedom of speech. And where is it most likely to be? Where is it being attacked now? At the universities, the colleges, at the academic level, where the very thought of it is it, it's so bizarre to me that where the exchange of ideas has now been essentially diminished, if not banned. So do you want to give us a couple of minutes on that, Jay? Mm -mm. Okay, <laughs> so let's. Uh, no, 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 no. No, all right, it's fine. All right, have, have I, I've been uh, I've been crushed before. It doesn't matter. I have no feelings about it. You know, it. If, <laughs> if we're going to keep this little thing going, I don't want to crush you. It's it's getting. Um, no, I I do think. Look, freedom of speech is terribly important, and um, and I think it's important, particularly for our younger people, for Generation Z, for our millennials, for them to have a healthy appreciation of what the other side thinks. Um, if we go back to Lincoln for a second, the genius of Lincoln was he, he believed deeply in the United States. He thought the Southerners were traitors for what they did, but never did he demonize them. He always, he never called them the enemy. He always called them those people over there. And, um, and I told this story yesterday, and I, I just want to tell it again, that at the end of the war, after the surrender at Appomattox, Lincoln went back to the White House, and, and, um, and he appeared on the balcony, and there were some there was like a thousand serenaders out there who were just waiting to hear some words from the, the, the victor of Appomattox. Just tell us, what are we going to do in America next? And, um, and Lincoln didn't have a prepared speech, and he kind of appeared, and he looked almost ghostly. And he didn't look very well because he was just so exhausted, and he lost so much weight, and the war had worn so heavily on him. Um, but he looked over to a band that was on the, on the lawn of the White House, and he asked him to play the song Dixie. And the reason why he asked him to play the song Dixie is he was saying, this too is part of America. We need to know each other. We need to understand each other. We need to respect each other. And I think that's kind of the core of what we are as a country. So I think it's terribly important, whether it's for younger people or older people, that we be able to have debate. It can be vigorous. It was, it's, it's been vigorous in this country. This is not the first time. When you look at our partisan bickering, you know, my God, if you go back to the founders, you don't, you don't think they bickered? They hated each other. They despised each other. When Washington and, and, um, and Hamilton looked over at Jefferson and Madison, they were worried that they were going to basically import the, Fran the French Revolution here to America. And then when Jefferson and Madison looked over at Hamilton, 
they thought he was going to bring monarchy back. So they fought and they fought hard and they did not like each other. Yet somehow, as I said, they did it peacefully, they did it vigorously, and, um, and the power of an idea is a, is a beautiful thing. And it's the ideas that have always held sway, not violence. Should we bring our readers in at the four minute mark and take a couple of questions? Be happy to. Sammy? He, he became the nominee because he had these marvelous debates with Stephen Douglas in which they, they would get together for some eight hours at a time and they debated and they discussed basically slavery. And it was in the heels of slavery that Lincoln kind of promulgated and pushed himself into national fame. And, um, and he did so with this party, this party called the Republican Party, which was only six years old. And the Republican Party in that day it was the Progressive Party. They were the ones who hated slavery. It was the Democrats who were supporting slavery. And, um, and you know, in Lincoln's case, basically it was like Lord Byron. One day he awoke to find himself famous. Um, but as I said, nobody could have been less prepared for the job, and yet somehow this was the man who restored the United States. This was the man who eradicated slavery. This was the man who gave us the most brilliant inaugurals the world has ever seen the first and second inaugural. And, um, you know, there's a, it's an incredible thing, this thing called leadership. And what America has had is we've had the good fortune that when we've most needed it, we've had presidents who rise to the occasion and somehow have guided us. Um, is that going to happen every time? Who knows? Another question, please. Wait, wait, can you second row? Yeah. I haven't read it. Sorry. What personality traits run through all these famous people? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think, well, they're all intelligent, but they, they ferociously believe in their ideas and they're tenacious and they don't give up. They're willing to weather defeat after defeat after defeat somehow to get to success. And um, I mean, I guess I would kind of separate there are the Democrats, there are the autocrats, and, and there are different animals. Um, you know, a Robespierre, who was in the French Revolution, well, I mean, he kind of got his, he got, a, got his wings on political violence against the other side. Um, whereas with the Americans, um, they've all believed in the American idea. They've all believed in the American ideal. You know, I think of, I think of George Washington, and there's this one little... Uh, one marvelous vignette that always comes back and, and um, resonates with me, and that was that was near the end of near the end of the Revolutionary War, um, where the men weren't being paid, and um, and his own top generals came to him, and they were thinking about instituting a coup, and um, and Washington said, "Hold on a second. and um, and what he did was he he said, "Excuse me," and he took out he took out his glasses here. And he put them on to read the list of demands and the grievances of, the, of these generals who were plotting this coup. And he said, if you excuse me, gentlemen, I have not only gone old in the service of my country, but I've gone blind. And, um, and the men actually literally began weeping right there. So, I mean, in a sense, leadership is not only about holding on to ideas, but it's about acting. It's about thespianship. It's about moving and, um, and guiding people. It's about persuading them. And I think all our leaders are able to do that. Jay Winnick, it has been an honor to get to know you. Thank I mean that. It's fabulous. Thank you. Great that, sense that of humor.